Hello again, it's the Creative Bean Podcast and I'm your host, Katie Cowan. This week for episode 45, my guest is Kat Howe, a creative director and the founder of Lisbon-based studio Howe & Howe. Kat's someone I've known on social media for nearly a decade. I first became acquainted with her and her husband, Roger, when they ran Howe Kapow, an online design shop selling prints, stationery and homeware, amongst other things. But after seven years of that, which they ran from their home in Bristol, they had an opportunity to move to Portugal and so grabbed it with both hands. That's where they are today, serving clients all over the world from their boutique agency. Change isn't anything new for Kat. You could say it's shaped her entire career in life. So in this episode, we talk about Kat's adventurous spirit and how she's followed her gut. We discover what she studied at university and how she found herself in the field of graphic design. We talk about how what's going on in the world can impact us and why there's all there's always silver linings to look for during difficult times. There's also a lot of insight into growing a creative studio too. But before we listen to our chat, allow me to thank our sponsor for season two of the Creative Boom podcast. Shillington is the original graphic design bootcamp that helps students achieve award-winning portfolios and land incredible jobs. No experience required. Study online or on campus at six campuses worldwide. We'll be hearing some career advice from one of Shillington's teachers later in the show. But for now, here's my chat with Kat. Hi, Kat. It's lovely to see you. Lovely to see you too, Katie. Gosh, we've been we've been kind of acquaintances online on social media for oh. um, for many many years, but this is the first time I've actually seen your face move. I know. I was thinking that too. I was like, I feel like a an, an old friend, and I'm like, oh, it's just one of those. Yeah, I feel well. We have we've known each other online for for over ten years or so. Like maybe Probably. Longer. Yes, mm. probably something like that. It's quite crazy, really, how social media has brought the world together and opened up all these doors for us. And uh, yeah, that's true. yeah it, it's kind of shaped our careers a lot as well, hasn't it? Yeah, it has. I think, uh, yeah, it's um, anyone trying to do something, I suppose, within the creative industries over a long period of time, you start to see, you know, recognize same faces and, uh, and you know, it's we're, you know it is quite a small world in a way so hmm. yeah it's not it's not surprising that the same people sort of get to know each other after over a long period of time I think well I suppose we first met when you were running this amazing machine how kapow <laughs> yes <laughs> yes yeah the first foray into working for for ourselves yeah that was how that was um gosh probably 15 years ago we set that up Roger and I from our bedroom in Bristol and um yeah it was uh, it was a good experience probably probably did it for a bit too long I think in the end uh, mm. now I look back and I'm like oh I wish we'd just gotten into you know what we're doing now earlier but then I suppose you can always say that about stuff in life you know you pick up stuff you don't even realize you you know you uh, you're learning and um it will come back and help you another time another life down down the line I reckon yeah, but I think that that's the benefit of hindsight, isn't it? And when I look yeah. at your career and what you've done, you actually, I don't, I don't feel like you um, are shy of change at all. In fact, I, you know, it's, it's a career and life of change, if, if I'm allowed to say. Yeah, no, totally. I think Rog and I have always had a constant, which is the two of us wanting to just do something together. So that's always been our North Star. And in a way, that's helped us to be able to flex into different things and, you know, take leaps perhaps a lot more easily, um, which we probably, I mean, I'd like to think that I would have done all this stuff anyway, if I hadn't been with him, but it's certainly, it's nice to have a, a partner along the way who can share experiences with you. And so, yeah, we've just evolved and constantly um, just trying to, you know, uh, we're always thinking about the next thing. The um, next adventure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> How did you two meet? Oh, uh, we met. Um, we met at Bristol University when we were students in the first year, and I um, I remember thinking that Rog was. I really. I thought he was a bit annoying. Actually, I met him <laughs> at a party, and uh, yeah, he. I, th- I, I, I think he asked for some tobacco or something, right? and it's the wrong sort of tobacco I had. Don't smoke now, by the way. 
just a cat. Yes. Yeah, my mum's listening. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, and so and I, you know, but then he was a mutual friend, and I think I probably did quite like him. And then we had this uh, random bumping into each other on the street outside of uh, our um, where we were uh, like studying on uh, Woodland Road in Bristol, and uh, went to the pub, and I dragged my flatmate at the time, which was just a total spare part, poor thing. And then, uh, <laughs> yeah, and then we've we've probably not spent longer than you know a week apart ever since, and that was about uh, twenty years ago now. Oh, that's lovely. I've got a very yeah. similar relationship and it's, it, yeah, it's pretty special mm. when you've been able to find mm. someone like that. Um, okay. So uh, did you did you grow up in Bristol or? No, I, um, well, I grew up a bit, a bit all over the shop, really. My mum's my Portuguese, my dad's English and um, uh, I was born in Brighton originally and then we moved to Thailand where I spent most of my like youth and then we moved back to Brighton and Gosh. then we moved to India, um, and I came back when I was about 15. And then I did my GCSEs up uh, in Manchester, and uh, my parents Yay. still live there. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, <laughs> yeah, and then went to uni, to, to, to get here actually, went to South America, and then went to uni after that. So, and now we're, we're here in, um, in Lisbon. Do you think having that kind of adventurous, moving around a lot lifestyle as a, as a child has sort of given you that kind of adventurous spirit? You know, you can't sit still. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's a blessing and a bit of a curse as well, because in many ways, you, you know, that there's all this stuff out there. But it also, you know, I have lots of cousins here in Portugal and they haven't even left, you know, they haven't left the city. My, my family are originally from Porto and uh, and they're very content, you know, and I, I sometimes do envy a bit of that, just being happy with what you've got. But then in another way, you know, uh, <laughs> we're always, mm-hmm. yeah, I've always, always known that there's, there's more out there. So even though I did love, I love Bristol and uh, when we lived in London, we loved London too. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just felt like, you know. Did nice Roger a have a more. similar kind of childhood or? Yeah, it, his, his parents oh. are Australian um, and he grew up in France. Um, and so also have that um like little bug I suppose yeah so it was it was a lot easier for us to make move a few years ago because we always spoke about it and we talked about it for a long time so um yeah yeah, I think that helped as well yeah because you you've um you went so let's go back to your university days Mm. at Bristol what what did you study there was it English English lit yeah Uh, I was I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, I, lo- I, lo- I love reading books and my dad was like, cats, you know, you should, um, you should just, you know, go to university and like, you know, do something, you know, proper. And I really wanted to do fine art actually. Um, uh, but, uh, no, I was like, no, 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 it's right. Was like, you can always do art in your spare time, which obviously I didn't. I went to the pub in my spare time. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I went to, went to, in, read, read English um, and it was quite cool the course was really good we didn't have any exams so it was all just like reading you know uh, a Shakespeare book a week which I was sort of always trying to cram in but I, I it's funny because I didn't yeah I was always trying to put in a bit of art into my into my essays um, and so yes although I loved it and I loved words and then I went on to be a, 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 wrote, um, a journalist for a few years afterwards um, it was just only, it was very two-dimensional for me. I felt like I still needed that little design or art thing. Yeah, because I was going to, that was going to be my ne- next question because you were a journalist for a little while and then you moved to Australia and then you kind of retrained in graphic design over there, didn't you? Yes, yeah. I don't, I mean, looking back at it now, it was a bit of a, uh, yeah, learned some basic Photoshop, did some, I mean, yeah, and then basically learned the hard way, started out, um, at a studio in Melbourne after about a year of doing a course uh, in, Mel- in Melbourne at an Alex Lyon School but it wasn't a very well known one I actually can't even Latrobe I think it was called um, and then just uh, cut my teeth at this agency and I, I mean I really crashed and burned the first few months I mean some terrible you know printing errors losing files <laughs> my grace director was like oh my god but um <laughs> I, I, I won we've all I been there <laughs> yeah exactly so I was just like I remember having these horrible feelings and when we have new and um, staff start now like I always remember that feeling of just feeling like oh my god you know um I'm trying I try and make them feel um a bit calm because I, I remember what it was like um but I had a few good 
um, lucky breaks, I suppose. We had this jeans, we were doing this jean project and I had to like sculpt these uh, sculptures out of jeans and I made a crocodile and a palm tree and by some fluke I managed to put it off and they were quite successful. So I think I sort of, yeah, snuck in that. And by that time, after about a year, I was really a bit more proficient in, you know, the um, Photoshop and illustration and all that. So I was sort of then clawed my way back up. <laughs> yeah, which is cool. yeah, yeah, very cool. And you have to <laughs> often find your way like that. But um, yeah. what, what what was the thing that got you into sort of graphic design? Why, why did you sort of go down that route? Well, I felt like it was a commercial art, which I don't think is um, a bad thing. I think we were always told... Um, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, but certainly in Portugal, there was this idea that um, commercial art wasn't very good. And even at at uni, there was, I don't know, I mean, we were always being, um, at uni, I mean, St. Martin's, we were always being told that being commercial wasn't necessarily great. We had to find our own practice and our own style. And I get that, but I also think that at the end of the day, you have to make money. And so I I like the idea of uh, being able to use design to create you know, for, for, for purpose and to create things that people needed and um, could relate to as well. So that for me really resonated and just the fact that you can also use words and typography and, you know, and that also was, was something that was really interesting. Yeah, that's that's mm-hmm. great to hear because there'll be a lot of people who come out of university with a similar sort of degree and, you know, maybe perhaps in fine art, maybe not English literature and mm-hmm. they kind of suddenly have that awful realisation, oh gosh, how am I going to make money? Because <laughs> yeah, you don't, yeah, you know, sure. uh, we we just didn't think, did we, when we were kids? I mean, I remember going through that kind of um, decision process with um, speaking to my father actually for some advice and I wanted to do English and he sort of said, well, what kind of jobs that are going to get you at the end of it all. And so, mm. well, I said, I'd love to do journalism, but I'm a bit worried it's going to sort of just put me in a box and then there's going to be no route out. And um, well, he said, it's a very vocational degree. I don't think you'd go far wrong, transferable skills. And so I just went for it. Mm. Um, but yeah, we a lot of people do just sort of get a little bit confused because the pressure at that age, how on earth are we supposed to know what was, we're going to do with the rest of our lives? Yeah, I know. It's a toughie. I mean, <laughs> I mean, coming, almost coming back to what I was saying earlier, I can, you know, with the rose tinted glass, you can look back and be like, oh, I wish I'd done this differently. But you're right. I mean, I think yeah. you just, you, you, you take advice from your parents, obviously, because you haven't done it before. So you're like, you know, and then sometimes, you know, they've got your interests, but they don't necessarily have your, maybe they've also got some of their interests at heart and they don't re- really realise it. And I think that um, I did certainly, um, have a few arguments with my parents about what to do with my life uh, at that point because they were very much pushing me towards a really academic um, English degree and uh, uh, and pushing me towards uh, going to Oxford, um, which uh, we sort of sh- struggled with a bit. Not, not you know, I, I mean, uh, it's it's very good for, for for lots of people and it's an amazing place. Um, but for me personally, I didn't. So we did clash a bit about that. So, mm-hmm. yeah, at that point, it was, um, uh, I, yeah, it's difficult to look back and say, oh, I wish I'd done this. And I don't want to, you know, no regrets. But, um, yeah, I mean, I suppose at the end of the day as well, it's, it's you know, I think there's some statistic that says you can have seven different sorts of jobs in your life. And, and I think yeah. more now so more than ever, you know, it's not, it, we, we're not really in a vocational culture anymore. Um, no. You know, you can chop and change and there's so much blend now between, you know, it all like design, you know, anyone can be, not anyone can be a designer, but like people can still have, you know, a dabble in design or they can dabble, you know, there's so much more access oh. to different sorts of things now that. So much more. Mm. And I think, I think when we were, when we were kids, I suppose, um, I suppose we were kids, weren't we at 19, 18, 19, mm. um, we, we didn't really know that that was the case. We didn't know that we could like change and chop and, and you and I have, have changed a lot. You know, that's something mm-hmm. definitely we share in common free spirits don't like to be pinned down. How, you know, where's the next adventure? You know, I very much, um, yeah, I'm on the same level there, definitely. But yeah, if anyone's listening to this and they're kind of panicking, don't worry, you can change your career at any time. And, yeah, and there's always absolutely. different paths you can take, which is great. So mm. but so you came back to the UK after Australia. Um, what, what brought you home? 
Uh, well, it was actually getting it onto the uh, MA course at St. Martin's to do communication design, which was something that, um, you know, was really was a really amazing experience, although everyone like <laughs> sort of cried a lot. Um, I <laughs> uh, we all really bonded, actually, like some of my dearest sort of, um, friends from London uh, uh, did that course and we all like got through it together Um and so it was that, and also Roger and I were, just, we got engaged in Australia, so there was another little, like, we wanted to get married at some point that year too, but yeah, it was, get, it was getting on the course at CSM, and it was really good, I mean, we um, we learned so much more, you know, most of the time there wasn't a computer in sight, which had bits of paper, and, um, uh, but it was more, yeah, I mean, I look back at that, and it was incredibly formative, mm. um, so I'm really I'm really glad I did it. But yeah, it was a toughie. It was quite tough. When did you graduate from there? Was it 2006? It was 2007-2008. So we got back and the financial oh. crisis had just happened. Um, right. So from timing wise, was, but maybe it was quite a good time to be uni, to be fair. But um, <laughs> And it was good. We were in a flat with our old friends, some old friends from Bristol Uni. And so we were like, oh, it was nice to see old, old friends again and be with old friends but yeah so I graduated um 2010 actually so yeah we got married in 2009 and then 2010 we then moved to um Bristol from London and then set up Halkapal. Brilliant I got married in 2009 as well. Oh, congrats. This is, yeah, yeah. Congrats. Vintage year. <laughs> Vintage it's a, it's a good year. What was your colour theme for the wedding? Oh god actually you remember? Wow, yeah that was one thing I didn't learn from my mum she always said to me what's the colour theme and I said I didn't even know it was a thing, but mine was multicolored actually because um, we I designed uh, well I, I put out a, I put a poster up at, at college um, to design my wedding dress because I thought a student would be um, from the fashion school would take it up and I had a few I mean I had this amazing design one of <laughs> didn't go for it in the end of like this two, this star silver tutu but in the end one of the um, tutors from the fashion school designed it and oh, wow. constructed it. And uh, we did this print where I designed a little, like, a um, pattern which involved every one of the people that were coming to the wedding. I think there's 68 people. And my granny and Roger's granny had died actually that year into those little shape oh. with an outline or a fill to represent them. So it was all printed on this bodice and this big bow. It was... This doesn't it surprise was, me at all. Yeah. <laughs> now Any opportunity red to be creative. Oh, covered in red wine. Oh, yeah, no. I, know. I saw it the other day. I was like, oh, my God. Yikes. Must anyway, have been a good day. <laughs> it was. We had two weddings, actually. One in uh, one in Bath and then one in uh, Porto. For, for my oh. Portuguese fan, so. Oh, fabulous. <laughs> so, um, how did that um, year, that kind of, you know, graduating just in the sort of aftermath of that global recession, um, mm-hmm. just kind of when I started Creative Boom, actually, um, how did it mm-hmm. sort of, you know, fare for you? Do you think that the, 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 the tough climate at the time kind of shaped how you are, your entrepreneurial spirit, or do you think it just kind of, it was, that was already there and the recession just sort of added a bit of flame to it? Hmm. Well, it's certainly, yeah, that's a really good question. Because I think in a way, it made us feel like we could, like, probably setting up our own business was a really uh, good thing to do. Because we were like, well, there might not be much else out there. So let's just do what we've got to do. Let's move to Bristol. And there wasn't much going on. There was hardly any work in Bristol at all. So we were like, okay, let's let's try it. And um, Raj had also started, he, he was working in radio production and um, Melbourne and then when we moved over it was really difficult as well so I was at college like tinkering away like <laughs> crying with my friends and uh, and then he was and then he actually had a couple of, he had about a year where he was struggling to find some work and then he managed to start getting a few little jobs then started and managed to get some started to get some work in BBC which then turned into more full-time stuff so when we moved to Bristol he still had to commute into London um, almost every day um, oh, and sometimes just Hard for like work. a 15 minute meeting it was before zoom it seems really crazy now to think of that but um it was before all of that I don't know that it was it was much of a thing so you sort of had to physically be at places and stuff yeah so yeah we, we definitely had the lifeline of London still for about a year but we it was a lot easier for us to feel like we could just we, we should just do it because there wasn't much else going on yeah, and How Kapow was like a, a shop, but it was it was run like a kind of creative studio almost, wasn't it? 
Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, I think I think looking back at it now, that was it. We'd, we'd style the shoots for the Instagram as if we were doing a little photo shoot and cutting bits of paper out and, um, yeah, spending ages, you know, uh, making sure the pictures were nice and polished and white and, um, yeah, I suppose it was. It was the beginning of it. And then we, we you know, I love colourful stuff, but then got to a point, oh, we had our second kid and it was just... Uh, big storeroom of boxes and I just got a bit like oh it's just <laughs> loads of stuff and so um yeah we decided that it would just be nice to sort of downsize and um try something new yeah <laughs> yeah is, and is that when you sort of decided it was time to move to Portugal and have a new adventure yes I think um we yes I think having yeah having going straight down to just a small laptop and um, trying to set up the business. Then we had a co-working as well, which we um, had a bit of a dipped our toe into a little bit. Um, and that's, uh, well, that's still going actually, but in a very small capacity in Bristol. Um, yeah. And we, uh, yeah, I think that's when we decided that it was now or never really. And, um, and so, we knew that the kids were growing up and it actually it was it was completely by fluke uh, that we moved here when we did because we came out on a bit of a recce one spring and I think we just had a, had a particularly grey like drizzly drizzly you know winter and the kids yeah. had been sick for ages and uh, and it was just quite you know tough um, and then we, we we came here in spring uh, for two weeks and stayed in different parts of Lisbon and then on the last day we went to the school the school that we just had seen online like the day before and we went to look around it for our oldest son Rollo and uh, the, the headmistress said oh you know there's one spot but it's not for next year it's for like in seven weeks we were like okay wow. <laughs> so we, we came back and um, yeah and then we just basically just decided to do it so in seven weeks, you just kind of packed yeah. everything up, and did you have yeah. a house to sell? And we we put our house on Airbnb in Bristol, and uh, wow. we got a van uh, uh, and drove <laughs> all our stuff over. <laughs> so it was a bit it was a bit mad, um, but uh, Rog came over for a couple of weekends and tried to find some a uh, flat um, when I stayed in Bristol with the kids and. Yeah, it was quite, I mean, in a way, it's sort of, it was quite nice because we were like, oh, no, in a year, you know, in a year, let's do it in a year. And then actually when we were presented with it, we thought, oh, well, you know, you know, no time up present. So. Just do it. Mm. Yeah. I think that life, sometimes I find, you know, you can sort of get stuck. Yeah, you can have, mm. have these moments where you get stuck and you know that something's bugging you. And then there'll be these sort of serendipitous moments where you're like, oh, okay, this is like now or never. We could go for this. We could do this. Yeah. And so many people don't do it, whereas you do and I do, although mm, yeah, I've been do, stuck, do. you know, myself in, in various stages of my mm. life. But it's, it's, it's the interesting thing I'm always trying to sort of I'm trying to sort of figure out what it is that takes a person to be to have the guts to go okay we're just going to dump everything here we're going to uproot everything even with children and we're going to go and do that but I suppose in your case it wasn't too difficult because you have family over there and you know yeah, the, the country. Well, I, that's true so that definitely helped um although my my family in Porto are, are like always like why did you move to Lisbon and not Porto? And I'm like, oh, sorry, no <laughs> offense to Porto. I love Porto. But um, so that has, uh, and actually funnily enough, again, because I have lots of family up there, I, I, I don't actually have any family down here at all in, in Lisbon. But no, that definitely helps. The language helped. We've been talking about it for so long. Um, yeah. And I think it's about almost seeing how far you can uh, push it. It's not even a conscious decision. I think we always had a bit of a, and it itched to scratch and whenever we'd go on holiday we'd go to some markets and be like oh wouldn't this be nice if we could have a little fish market or a little you know oh, and we'd yeah. always be and maybe I got you know a bit tired of just you know telling myself that it was um you know what if what if and um so I think it's that and I think it's also maybe um uh, just being exposed to stuff as well when we were you know kids growing up and and having that um mm. sense of always there being something else out there um in terms of changing it up um because I look back at my career and I think 
oh my god what have I done like I've been all over the shop and I, I <laughs> sometimes do envy people who have just like gone in and like are really good at their craft and they've been you know graphic designers for like 20 years and they've got all this wealth of experience but um you know, and I do definitely have moments like that. Roger's a lot more like, no, no, it's great what we've learned. And, you know, yeah, our business definitely. stuff that we've learned in business. So it's, it's you know, we, we have been proper little magpies where we have just sort of done all sorts. And sometimes, you know, yeah, it would be nice to have probably stuck something for a bit longer. But um, no, I don't know, I, I maybe just... we would have, I don't know. <laughs> no, I disagree because I think I, I truly believe that we're all on our own kind of path. And, and mm. you know, whatever we've gone through and learned, those are transferable skills. Um, and you might have, you know, a different perspective to someone else, you know, that's helped you get to where you are and now running your creative studio in Lisbon. But um, Lisbon is is a great choice as well in terms of the fact that it's a creative hub. Mm. So you must you must that must have been quite conscious yes. thing in you know yes, in your decision. It definitely it definitely helped. Like we didn't it it really we did have some criteria and for many years. Um, Portugal and I, I don't, I really hope that we, we pull through after this pandemic because we are very reliant on tourism over here. But um, for many years, it wasn't really viable. And, and I'd always, we'd always come back for, for holidays and I'd spend two or three months every year when I was, you know, when I was growing up um, with my mm-hmm. family up north. Um, but it wasn't, you know, there were great deals to be had of like these beautiful uh, houses going for nothing, like right on the riverfront and all this stuff. But it just wasn't, there was no um, way of making our business viable over here because it wasn't, we couldn't work remotely or whatever. Um, yeah. And so when we moved, which is probably about two and a half years ago now, three years ago, um, it was just at a, a, a point where Portugal, we've got, well, Lisbon in particular, we've got um, a quite... Uh, a good mayor he's very good at marketing Lisbon and we had a few good things happen to us being uh, we had this thing called web summit which is uh, happens every year and when it was online last year um, yeah. and it's a massive melting pot of all these tech companies and it's quite exciting and mm. I mean it's uh, Lisbon itself is just so beautiful um, the creative industries here there's lots of really good little studios and there's um there isn't obviously it's not as well established at all like london for example but um there is a lot of creativity around in general there's lots of inspiration to be found even just in old tiles and different sort of you know things that are just actually just stuck in the past because they haven't changed you know for like 50 years and you know you you go to the hairdresser you're like oh my god wow that's really cool how they've just painted a typography (laughs) out of um like Uh, like there's some mechanics and he's written his whole name out of like little like um tubes but on tiles it looks i'll I'll take a photo i'll send it to you it's amazing (laughs) so stuff like that um is inspiring um as well so and you know with the the sun and and the colors of the houses (sighs) stop it now it's stop (laughs) it Right, I've had enough. That's it, I'm off. <laughs> Go and visit. <laughs> no, I mean, actually, Manchester for the last week hasn't been too bad. I can smell spring in the air and oh, I keep, nice. my office is in the attic at home and I keep popping my head out the window like a lunatic, yeah. just sort of like looking back and forth. <laughs> and sometimes I'll just lean out there and just breathe the yeah, air in breathe. and smile. <laughs> but Manchester as well has got such a great scene and, you know, I yeah, think it's the it's unexpected place. places. Obviously, London is, is is great, but there are, you know, these these pockets of creativity everywhere, um, which uh, if you can tap into that and if you've got other ways of finding inspiration as well as, then, um, mm. you know. You Definitely. Mm. When did you move then? Did you move before the, the, uh, res- the um, Brexit was announced? We moved after, actually, oh, um, okay. and that was one of the reasons as well why we decided to sell Halka Power because we knew that, like, overnight, basically 20% of our <laughs> profit margin has just been wiped off. So we, we, we knew that it was going to be really difficult for us to export, import, import, mm. I mean, and, uh, and did sell overseas. Um, so yeah. when that happened, we were like, oh, gosh, I don't know if this, this business is going to be viable. So we knew it was probably best to, to um, you know, to move on to something else. So in a way, in a weird way, it was like, you know, a, a real push as well. To so that was an mm. external force, I suppose. So coming back to what you were saying about what is it? Maybe it's being sensitive to external forces which are outside of our control. Or you know, you know I obviously voted, but 
um, I voted to remain because I believe in yeah. that. But so, I know that there are other external forces, you know, and so everyone has their own vote and their own opinion. And for us, um, we when, when that happened, we were like, okay, well, if that's going to be the case, let's just see what we can do and see if we can um, try and then mitigate our own uh, issues that are going to arise in our business and uh, and work around that. Um, yeah. which is why yeah we decided to, to come over here so to go to go mm. for it and um yeah i was trying to buy some uh, lovely um um products from somewhere in denmark yesterday um and it i'd ordered put all the stuff in the trolley and i was really excited because there's this beautiful vase made from a local mm. designer really treating myself to a few little things mm. and um then i got to check out and it said sorry not currently <laughs> delivering to the uk oh. and i was like god damn it i know i know <laughs> it's not fair oh my, i know all, <laughs> all these, these amazing lo- people yes but similarly from from my end as well i've got design like a jeweler's like i was trying to get something from wolf moon the other day and i love her stuff and i've been buying her stuff for you yes. know, years and um and I, it just wasn't like i, I need to send something back um to get fixed and then i we went to the post office and there was like forms we had to fill out online before and I was like oh my god oh my is it worth it I'm just gonna wear them broken now because I don't really like I can't. and so hopefully it will get sorted but it's the same on this end you know we're all yeah. here at work people are like oh I wish we could still like anyway oh, no. so hopefully it's it'll get sorted you know sad times but you know mm. I suppose we have to just move on um mm. so how did this last year do you think compared to the global recession for you hmm. was it worse or was it dare I say um, better? this year was this year was uh well it was better I think because we had an established we, uh, we were sort of we were it was we were quite fortunate because our little agency is still very small and so we didn't have you know lots of expenses we didn't have loads of staff so we, we managed to retain everyone we had um we um had a some retained clients that kept with us which were great and so we've been able to build from that and because I think we're doing stuff digitally we're almost operating on a bit of parallel universe to friends I have who run cafes here or uh, who are working in a very different sector so I think we've been able to weather the storm better because we people are wanting websites people are wanting um, you know are realizing digital marketing helps uh, their business and um, the global recession 2008 was very different because we were still, you know, kids and Rog was doing sandwich deliveries on a bike around London, like, you know, and that was it, you know, we really, so very, very different um, sort of, yeah, uh, way of seeing things. But we were, if we'd probably been a bit older as, a, as an agency, it would have hurt a bit more because we, you know, I don't know, we, we would have had to probably let some people go, but we were just... yeah. We managed to, um, yeah, get get through that. So, I suppose um, we've always we're always searching for silver linings when these difficult mm. things happen. Um, and in in this case, for the creative industries, one silver lining might be that um, the pandemic has accelerated on. Um, the acceptance that you don't have to have those meetings in person, yes. um, that you mm. can sort of actually maybe start to think about the environment and do a video call instead and yeah. say, save money and time. Totally. And, and Exactly. And I know mm. that there are re- repercussions from that as well. Um, you know, mm. there's a story out today saying, you know, if, if things don't return to the way they were and if they're pre- predict as they're predicting a third less... Um, uh, fewer people going into the city um, in, of London, for example, then that is just going to have such an impact on the hospitality sector and other mm-hmm. businesses relying on those commuters. So it's not always just this perfect magic yeah. wand, is it? There's always going to be somebody that gets hurt when these changes happen. So it'll be interesting to see um, whether um, business around the world embrace more of this technology and um, or whether or whether they'll be desperate to get back into office space, get back into sort of face to face meetings, because mm. dare I say it, then nothing really beats being in the same room as the other person. Mm. Mm. But um, as I yeah. found with doing this podcasting with the, the, you know, I was so worried about it not having the same, you know, magic as being <laughs> in the same room. But actually, you can still yeah. get that. It's 
it's just a yeah. sort of change in mindset isn't it exactly whether, and, yeah yeah and whether it's it'll normalized. carry on whether it'll carry on well that's it and I think the good thing is that it has normalized it for many people and um, tech has become you know it's accelerated it uh, into people's lives a lot more than I mean I would have eventually have happened for sure but um, so yeah people are more used to um, I don't know seeing just speaking face to face like this and being um, and that and that's I don't think that will ever go away and for us it's it's helped with clients because we do work with people around the world and it has become it's it's great but it has um normalized client meetings because before we were having to come over to london um every month or so uh which was insane really looking back at it yeah but that was just what was done and and almost not to do it with you know didn't give make enough effort to meet the client or whatever so (laughs) um which so that's that's good and i think i we but we really miss people we really like the first week when we all got back last week here um we didn't get any work done at all because everyone was just like <laughs> and so yes, Robbie even uh, this morning was like you know um I didn't I might have to work from home tomorrow because I didn't get any work done last week and so but we all just were so craving of that mm. you know being next to each other and you don't realize you know I, I was we have some designers who are still working at home here in Lisbon and I was like drawing something on the screen holding it up and we you know we we, we use Miro actually generally for for stuff but it was something I was like on a call to and I really and normally she sits right next to me and I was like oh you know when she's back after Easter then you know we'll do that so I mean you can't you you, you know you can't fake that and I think that um we all are just desperate to to hang out and just to have a have a giggle We're taking a little break to get some creative advice from our sponsor, Shillington, the original graphic design bootcamp. This time we hear from Kathy Sisson, a teacher based at Shillington's New York campus. Originally from Melbourne, Kathy is a designer, art director and calligrapher, also known as Kiyashi. I asked Kathy, what advice was shared to you that proved extremely helpful? Who was it and what did they say? Um, that would be my creative director, um, Annie Shortle, um, back when I was a junior designer back in Melbourne and she really kind of saw me as a designer and saw my strengths and allowed me to grow and saw potential. I think I really see her as a mentor and the advice she gave me is, was just to, just to go for it, give it a try. You know, even if you think that you can't do it, I think a lot of designers sort of suffer for a bit of um, imposter syndrome and a lot of doubt. Um, but she was always encouraging. And I think, I think that was always the best advice is to always try, um, whether it's applying for that company that you've always dreamed about, or if it's going across the globe, like I did and, you know, taking a chance on teaching, I think, yeah, trying is kind of like just the best way to sort of see where your design career can go, because there's no straight line. If there's one thing that I know about this design career, there's no one way route. Um, it can go up, it can go down, it can go sideways, but I think you have to actually just trust your instinct of where do I want to go? What do I want to do? Should I try in-house? Should I try agencies? You know, there is no right or wrong. Um, and I love that, you know, this, career can kind of evolve to way the way you evolve as well as a person. To find out more about studying graphic design at one of Shillington's six campuses around the world or via its online course, visit shillingtoneducation.com. Now, back to Kat. Don't um, take this as weird, but, you know, I th- I'm whilst I'm listening to you and and looking at your gorgeous big dangly earrings and your lovely blonde hair I'm thinking I'm fantasizing about a dinner party with you and I like sat next to you whilst you're pouring a glass you know pouring me a glass of red and sort of touching my elbow ever so slightly and saying darling tell me all about creative boom has it really been as hard work as you uh, make out in our private conversations <laughs> you know or something like that because you do you you find yourself just daydreaming I was doing a podcast yesterday with my friend Danny and um I was just sort of sat there thinking oh I can't wait to go out dancing with her like last time or like to for her to just come up and say, "Do you want another drink? I'm going to the bar." <laughs> All these little things, these that tiny we just miss. things, and I'm um, yeah, I I it almost feels a bit surreal to think about it. I don't know. Mm. I mean, 
uh, yeah, here it's, it's uh, I don't know, even having a lot beer, we almost feel a bit, you know, we're, we're, we're allowed to have them socially distanced here, obviously, but it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's good in a way, it'll get people back to appreciating the little things. I don't think it will last, I think humans are just hardwired to just forget quite Get quickly and be like yeah great you know it's always like this but I do remember the first after the first lockdown and we went for a drive and we went to we now live in Sintra just outside of Lisbon and just everything felt really green and fresh and that sort of lack of um almost that uh what's that when you uh de um when you when you've been re- deprived of like sensory deprivation almost and yes. I remember that really clearly and not, and not having had you know haven't really had that because you, you don't need to do that in your normal life you're always like stimulating yourself in some way and um when I thought that was and it lasted you know a day yes. <laughs> and the next day I was like oh this is normal again um yeah but exactly I, I, it's, it's you know and that's a shame you're always trying to like keep that remember that moment and keep that make that part of your life but actually you you do you know become you become used to things coping mechanisms I suppose we just sort of take things for granted and Mm. don't overthink things because if we did then maybe we wouldn't be as productive as we are as humans and all the rest of it Mm -hmm. so um do you think you'll uh do you think you'll ever change again do you think Lisbon is is where you're settled or yeah well I don't know (laughs) I was looking at like I don't know. We we, we have plans Best to pop. We we have plans that we'd like to open up maybe a little offshoot in the states at some point of the Ooh. same agency. Um, nice. Uh, so we were like, oh, you know, it would be nice to just go out there. And I know the market's very different, but that's just a little pipe little dream, dream we've been having. But Rog and I are also we're building a house. We <laughs> bought some land. Uh, yesterday actually uh, weirdly um, which was interesting um, but <laughs> incredibly I mean not not what we want to what not what we thought we wanted to do at all because we were like let's just get a house and let's just keep things chill but now um, there's there's not really much around and uh, we've got so a friend who can help us and we were like okay let's just do it so we just got this plot with like loads of trees on it which is good and uh and uh that's the new that's the new thing happening that's so the new that adventure happen concurrently mm. do you and roger always have to have a project do you always have to have something going on um <laughs> look back at something i i would like i would quite like a nice easy life but rog is always he's he he gets quite um into things and i think he gets quite a obsessed about something and likes to do it properly and then does it and I see this in my son now he's really into like magic tricks and last month he was really into making origami dogs and he just made like nice. hundreds of them and then so I'm like I can see this in him but I think we um uh, I, I I mean the the agency itself is such a, a big project that I, I don't we don't go looking for it I suppose but then when there's an opportunity I suppose I suppose we're opportunists sounds a bit yes. like a dirty word but um <laughs> terrible <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um yeah so uh, it's you know and I suppose just living out here is a project in itself because you know we're still it's, it's, it can it can be a bit tough sort of bureaucracy and like sort of, but um yeah yeah it can be can fresh. be tough keeps keeps it interesting mm. so how is the new studio going you're um you're doing some really meaningful stuff yes and we've got oh we've got some really nice projects in the pipeline actually which is about to to go live one of uh, which is for a wind turbine floating wind turbine um wow. company and we're also doing some a campaign for seaweed uh uh carb like a seaweed forest company here as well um and we have this uh we're doing work for uh, an investment fund which uh only deal with sustainable businesses so we've we've yeah, we've got a few things I can't wait to share, actually, because <laughs> they're, re- they're really fun um, and really what we want to be doing more of because we live by the sea and um, it's really sad when you go in and there's just loads of, um, you know, plastic everywhere and it's really, it really does impact us. Um, we, we see it a lot and so that's something we want to do more of and I think, um, you know, just trying to... So we started off doing... Um, uh, campaigns just in-house that we wanted to do just on our studio time mm-hmm. did a plastic one 
just because I saw an article about how much plastic we consume. And it was a bit sensationalist, the article. Well, it wasn't really, but the, the, stat, the statistic was that you eat like a plastic credit card size bit of plastic. Gross. Or something. Yeah. And I was like, well, is that real? Is that true? And then um, you know, when you collectively add it all put together, but I thought it was quite a visual, it was so visual, it was really, really stuck with me. So we just spun out um, a project from that and then that then people noticed that and then we've been from another thing I did with a, one, another designer uh, we did this thing about car tire plastic and then off the back of that we've had other so it, it was something we wanted to do anyway and then that's now led to the work we now want to do which which is which was yeah it wasn't actually pla- it wasn't planned that way but it was more no. yeah again something we wanted to do and then it just sort of has worked and now you're sort of working with these more kind of, you know, sustainable brands and, and mm. really sort of thinking about, you know, adding meaning. That that must be kind of, you know, really satisfying to see your work help make a difference in the world. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's, it is really satisfying. It's really, um, the, the car tire plastic one was one particularly that's satisfying because it was just me and um, another designer, an amazing guy called Christian, who's just such a di- total dude. <laughs> and he uh, we just we worked really well together and um uh, and it was something that a lot of people said afterwards was they hadn't they didn't know about car tires and about the pollution that comes off of them and and then we collaborated with this, the tire collective who are this um group of uh, students at um, imperial and royal college and they're developing this amazing contraption to go on the back of car or wheels that collect the, the particles um and so it was a really nice you know symbiotic um you know uh project that we did where we we all helped each other and and that was good because a lot of people don't really know about it it's not really something that's um spoken about much at the moment and so just raising that awareness was was really cool brilliant just going back to when we were talking about um opening up a creative studio in lisbon Mm. and um you know were you kind of were you and Roger obviously you had lots of contacts and friends in in the city Bristol and London probably mm. and but were you worried that like people wouldn't want to necessarily work with you if you were based out in Portugal and do you feel like that has actually you sort of got there at the right moment when it that kind of thinking was starting to change and that you know where yeah. you were didn't really matter yeah I mean to be fair the first um, the first bit when we started the agency, we started with a co with another director, lovely guy called Neil. Who, um, bless him, when we told him that we were moving to Portugal within seven weeks, he was like, he took it, he took it really well. But um, he stayed <laughs> in Bristol, and um, and we moved over there. And a lot of people are like, oh yeah, just moved to Bristol. Like, oh no, I'm sorry, moved to Bristol. I'm saying moved to Lisbon. Um, you know, just going to hang out on the beach. And we were like, no, no, like, we are, we do think it's viable. Um, but the first year was really tough. It wasn't, you know, uh, Rog had a car accident. He oh, uh, with kids in the back of the car, uh, and that was a bit difficult. Scary. And then um, the business, because we were, you know, it struggled. We hadn't really set the, the the agency was only a few months old. Actually, um, it was only four or five months old at that point. When we, well, maybe about nine months old at that point, when we moved because we planned to stay another year and like establish it in England and then move over because we did it so quickly it was still a little bit like it struggled we didn't have a good system for getting new clients in we um were still in half half of our head was still in the co-working so we're still trying to get that make that happen it was it was all over the shop to be fair it was just <laughs> and poor Neil struggled and then like it just it got to a point where he was like actually like I feel like I'm working in a startup which essentially it was um and it, you know and he he was like I you know can just needed an easy life as well and um he uh he went and got a job at another agency in bristol and so we were like fair dues, <laughs> fair dues. Yeah, um, and so we were like okay let's just so neil left oh yeah a couple of years ago well in november i think it was and then november last yeah oh god was it maybe two years ago now anyway but um yeah and so that was sad it was sad but in a way it was it, it was quite difficult to do it from both places and just like we were saying before being able to have times when you can all sit down and have a meeting and he did come over um the first month that we were here and we had a really nice time we sort of went out and um had and that was it was really cool um but yeah well we we couldn't keep on going and coming back to bristol and 
So I think we've realised that, yeah, having directors in one place, it really, really helps. Um, <laughs> and and then, yeah, we had some good luck as well. We had some um, really great designers move and we started working with some new designers that move over to, to Lisbon, um, started working with more people. And it just, you know, I think you've just got to give it time. And I think, um, yeah after a few years we just sort of found our rhythm and we got some stuff sorted and you know it always takes a bit of time for the dust it's not an easy it's not an easy process at all by any stretch Um, and it's tricky because essentially like with how pal i was buying and selling you know products online but with with this you're you're you've got to work out people's strengths and weak designers strengths and weaknesses and it's almost like you're, you've got to curate the right team and make sure that people are, you know, have got the right, also feel comfortable doing what they're doing and making sure that you're yeah. not asking them too much, but that they've also, you know, and so, and that takes time finding the right people um, as well who, uh, and it's a different sort of, you know, building a team is, 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 is a lot harder than obviously yeah, it like, really is. Uh, yeah. So I think and that's finding good people as well. That's, yeah. that's the biggest challenge of all, you know, people you can yeah. rely on, people who care yeah. about your business as much as you do. Exactly. And, and I think we've been really, really blessed that we've got some really, I mean, lovely, I mean, everyone who works with us is, is just, we've got some really solid, um, Romy and Anya, who are our two a project manager and account managers. Um, they are they're here with us and again that's really helped um and just are just an absolute bedrock basically for everyone and keep everyone going which is really really good so couldn't do it without them so the studio is in a really good place the move to lisbon was a really great choice you're looking very well very sun-kissed cat you know the the sun looks like it's (laughs) It's an orange light behind me (laughs) oh come on come on it's um it's great to see and um i suppose the the one sort of question i want to sort of leave this uh lovely conversation on is uh you know looking back in your kind of career in your life so far is there anything you'd have done differently um um I ask myself this question all the time I think um probably been I have moments where I think oh god I wish I had I don't know I um, I would have I would I would probably (laughs) finish how a bit earlier but that's um I would have probably um oh I don't know it's probably more of a personal thing where I feel like um, uh, there's actually quite well there's quite a lot I probably would have done differently but um, that's a difficult question I think I probably would have given um, more oh I don't know oh I don't know it's really tough isn't it because I look back on my life and I think oh. is there anything I would have done differently I mean because I think at my age now in my 40s I look back and I sort of can I, I can sort of connect all the things that led to the next thing, the mistakes that actually yeah. made me learn a lesson. So I think it's kind of a bit of a naive question, really. Would you have done well, anything differently? Because really what we do ultimately leads us to where we are now. It, it does. And I think for me, it's more of a, it's not even a ca- career thing. It's almost more how I was with, with people. Like, should I have given people more of the benefit of the doubt? Should I have been... Um, I don't know, more sympathetic or more open-minded or more, um, I don't know. I'm more, for me, I'm always, my, my biggest thing is always self-doubt about um, if I've behaved in the right way with people or been good to them or not being good, you know, when's the right time to, I don't Cat, know, I struggle with it the, all the time. Yeah, because, <laughs> because like, you're... You're a really nice person and unfortunately you're you're running a business and sometimes you have to make really difficult decisions that involve other human beings and it's it's horrible because um you care but you have to sort of remove that emotion out of it um and do what's right for the business. Yes. And that for me was probably the most challenging thing of of growing a PR agency. Yeah. It, it was just horrendous I remember the first time I had to make somebody redundant and afterwards I just cried it was just the most horrendous thing Um, that's that's basically the yeah the same thing and that's why I think there's Mm. so many of those moments because I was they all involve 
um, people and me feeling like I've let people down somehow. And uh, mm. we had to make Megan re- like a, an old uh, suburb redundant when we when the business was going badly in the first year we moved it. And I feel really, I think those things are moments that I, they're not nothing to do with like the, the, the work or uh, even the move. It's all all purely people that I feel like I've let down. And then I, and yeah, then I think, oh, I would have done that differently. And like you said, well, I think it is... They wouldn't have had that opportunity in the first place. And at the end of the day, you know, the sad thing is until everybody has been in that kind of situation themselves, running a business and being a boss, then, you know, I suppose they just Mm. couldn't possibly know. So I would, I would, yeah, definitely not worry about that. Interesting. Really good question. But that's it. And then, you know, hopefully you try and strive and, uh, and learn from those moments and try and not get yourself in positions again like that or try and not, you know, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> famous <definitely>. last words. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was going to one more question. I mean, what what kind of things have you? Do you feel you've really learned about yourself this last year? Because I've learned so much. I've really come on leaps and bounds. Um, the mm. the pandemic has just really forced me to sort of look in the mirror <laughs> and address some things. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Similarly, I mean, I think I don't know. It's um, it's been quite with. Roger and I, it's we we have we've been through quite a lot together, to be fair. And I think with the, the first bit, trying to do the business with the kids, we we learned, you know, there were different level, different lows. I think towards us, to have different pillars of stress and worry. And even though it seems great, like even just a few weeks ago, I, I remember saying to him, I don't know what to worry about next because we have to move out of our house next week. We're buying this land. I don't know if that's going to happen. Um, we were trying to uh, hire a new design director. Who, thankfully, we have hired now. Amazing. But that was quite difficult because there's lots of, you know, making the right decision. Uh, kids were uh, homeschooling at the same time and, like, stuff was slipping through the net. So there's lo- so many pillars. So, I think so much going that, on. <laughs> yeah, that I've learned to compartmentalise stress a bit better, <laughs> which is good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness me. Well, with so much going on, um, it's... Yeah. Uh, it's amazing, but I don't. I don't think you'd have it any other way, Kat. No, probably not. I mean, uh, I definitely wasn't thinking that <laughs> this time, like a month ago. I was like, "What's going on?" Um, but, but no, now like you know, the light is uh, you know the sun is shining and there is light at the end of the tunnel. And um, you know, it, it, whatever, whenever it's really bleak, storage remember it all. You know, it will always be better. It will always be good again as well. You know, so. Always, one of the nice things that. about one of the nice yeah. things about getting older, you know that no matter what, yeah. what what crap is flung at us, we know we're going to come out at the other side smelling of date roses. We'll be all right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, thanks so That's much, true. Kat. This has been lovely chatting with you. You're and... welcome. It really has been wonderful, Katie. It's fun to meet you as well, properly, and definitely, Maybe. you know, let's go for uh, well, you know, let's try and have that drink sometime. Glass of wine, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Creative Boom podcast with me, your host, Katie Cowan. If you're enjoying the show, please don't forget to subscribe or you could also leave us a review. It would all be hugely appreciated. Thanks also to our sponsor, Shillington, the original graphic design bootcamp that helps students achieve award-winning portfolios and land incredible jobs. Find out more at shillingtoneducation.com. Join me next time when I'll be chatting to typographic artist and designer, Danny Molyneux.